And as I learned it at my household, the election was stolen. Church became, church became the nominee because of some shenanigans in Mountain Home. It was 50 vote difference, 50 vote difference. No one invited me, I invited myself. We secretly invaded to try to overthrow Fidel Castro. Lecturing him about, next time you want a bridge in Idaho, talk to Walter Lippmann, who was the famous journalist at the time. And everybody supported the war, and then a decade later, where were the liberals? Where were the people against the war when we were all in? Us tree huggers are not popular people. And, and we walked up there to, to introduce ourselves to Frank Church, and Frank grabbed my hand and shook my hand. Russ, how you doing? Like we were old friends. And I'd never met the guy. Of course, my buddy, uh, Tommy Wright, he's like, oh my God, Tremaine is a big dude here. So he had, now later I'm like, now how, that was a trick. And so I know that, oh. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. I'm always so elated every time I drive up to this beautiful barn when I see all the vehicles outside. It just fills my heart that so many people keep coming to these events and to want to learn together and to learn about whether it's just history or within this series, Idaho history. I'm really glad to see very familiar faces and the new faces as well. My name is Samra Cullum and I teach at the College of Southern Idaho in the Education Department. I have known Russ for a very long time actually. Um, when I when my first college history class was with Dr. Tremaine way back in the day and he made such a lasting impact on me and it's such a nice pleasure to be able to introduce him tonight to all of you. And I come a little prepared because I like, I like a little cliff notes for myself. And so I want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Russ Tremaine just in case you don't know who he is and some of the work that he does here. Um, when he asked me to introduce him, I was, it was my pleasure and my honor to do that. Um, if you don't know, Dr. Russ Tremaine is Professor Emeritus of History at the College of Southern Idaho. With over 40 years of experience in teaching and researching history, he has earned the esteem of many of his peers. His impressive credentials um, include a bachelor's and a master's degree from Boise State University. I won't hold that against him as a Bengal and a vandal. <laughs> he got his doctorate from the University of Washington. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know, everyone's like, get off the stage. <laughs> Dr. Tremaine has received numerous awards and honors, such as the Phi Theta Kappa Distinguished Advisor Award, and the Idaho Library Association um, awarded him Book of the Year Award for his publication, Surviving Minidoka. If you have not seen the publication, I would highly encourage you to purchase it. He is also a co-founder of Preservation Twin Falls, and that is the entity that helps bring on history at the barn. So without Russ and all the people that, are, that work towards history at the barn, this wouldn't be possible. Um, he recently received the Estro Perpetua Award from the Idaho State Historical Society. The award recognizes people and organizations who have preserved and promoted Idaho's history, and I cannot think of anyone more appropriate than Dr. Tremaine. On a more personal note, Dr. Tremaine is more than just an accomplished historian. He is an exceptional mentor and motivator. Uh, Dr. Tremaine has always made me feel accepted, respected, and part of the local history circle. His openness and his willingness to open doors for others has always been really inspiring. He's a person who believes in the potential of others and he's willing to go to the extra mile to help them reach their own goals. He's an advocate for pushing the envelope, especially if you've been to one of his talks. <laughs> Rarely does he leave without pushing the envelope and he does inspire others to do the same. And not to mention, Russ is probably one of the best hype men around. Um, if you want to feel like good about yourself, you must have Russ introduce you to a crowd at some point in your life. He makes you feel like you move mountains. Um, it is with my great honor that I present to you my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Russ Tremaine tonight. That's very kind. Of you. 
you. Maybe I'll move. Thank you, Samra. This is Samra's brother here, uh, Arnell. And, um, and Arnell and I worked together making historical fiction together. Um, so thank you. Arnell, you good there with the test? Well, thanks for coming. We were worried that people wouldn't come out. My, my colleague here with Preservation Twin Falls, uh, Professor Matthews, is in charge of our publicity. And she told me a couple days ago, no one's coming, no one's responded. And I got a little bit cranky because I said, well, people are not interested in politics. There are these sexy subjects, and who really cares about William Bohr and Frank Church and foreign policy? Uh, when I went to graduate school, uh, I'm a political historian. My PhD is in international relations, but I learned that uh, at the time all history was social history. And political history and diplomatic history, as we used to call it, uh, was passe. So I was very much out of touch being a diplomatic historian. And, um, uh, and I, I left diplomatic history, really, after I finished my PhD. And, um, and I'm glad to be back and revisit it. Um, I want to just take a minute to uh, do a little bit of autobiography about how I came across the Frank Church Project. And I have here uh, my doctoral dissertation. I was moved when uh, Dr. Gentry was here and talked about some of his work. Uh, and as a historian, after four or five decades, you go through phases doing different things. And, and the church phase of my life was important, but uh, by accident. Uh, and uh, I published this dissertation in 1990. And I've not looked at it since the day it was signed, August 1st in 1990. <laughs> and I, quite frankly, I'm afraid to go back and look at any of my work because it's frightening thinking about errors and, and how, how poor it is. And this week I, and again thanks to Professor Matthews who, who ordered this for me. It was very expensive and took a lot of time because many years ago I lost my dissertation. It, it, I probably ran away from neglect. <laughs> uh, but I didn't really miss it. Uh, but this week I opened it. Uh, and read part of it. Uh, and I tease my colleagues, uh, Jim Gentry and, and uh, Professor Vipperman there, before I die, I hope to write a real book. Uh, because Dr. Gentry here has been retired a decade now. He's just finishing his third book. And I published my last book a, a decade ago, and I have nothing in the works. And all of my books I've published are fake books, history, uh, uh, his, uh, I call it uh, history is prostitution, that is I was paid for them. And they're picture books. And so when I read through this dissertation, I'm like, there are no pictures and like, this is serious business. <laughs> and again, it's been 30 years when I studied this and I did research at University of Washington. It's incredible that I got into the school and I was told when I was doing the dissertation it would have to be 500 pages long. I'd never written a paper longer than 25 pages. And that they expect it to be publication quality. If you go to University of Washington, you're in the history program, and you produce a dissertation, it becomes a book and you become somebody. And I'm speaking to my dear friend Sam McCollum here, and and soon to be Dr. Matthews, and soon to be Dr. Vipperman, when you get your dissertation, then you do something with it, and you publish it, and then you become like a major scholar, like the person that will be here next month, Mark Fici. So this is nostalgic for me, thinking about 30 years ago when I came across this project by accident and spent four or five or six years of my life with the Frank Church Project. I had another dissertation project that was chapter one 
uh, my thesis, the Cuban Revolution, the expropriation of American investment in Cuba, Cuban Electric Company, the largest investment in Cuba. Now, for us historians, if you want to publish something or do a thesis or a dissertation, you have to do one of two things. You have to have an original idea or you have to have original material. Now, I knew I would never have an original idea, so I thought in terms of original material. <laughs> and I was very fortunate to come across the archives at Boise Cascade that had the papers of the Cuban Electric Company. And I studied them. I did my thesis. Um, I'm not terribly proud of that, but I got my master's degree with it. And it was chapter one of my dissertation. And I received a full ride teaching fellowship to the University of Washington because of that thesis. Now my mentor died two years into my fellowship. And my plan was to go to Argentina and to Brazil where the utility companies were also expropriated or nationalized. Castro famously took over all of the utilities and refused to pay for them. And that's called expropriation. If the government is going to pay for it, they take it over, that would be nationalization. And that's what I was studying, Latin American nationalism in the face of US imperialism. But my mentor died. My fellowship expired. I had a child. I moved back from Seattle to Boise State, took up my old teaching job there as a full-time, part-time adjunct. I learned later adjunct is like an unnecessary attachment. <laughs> and at that time, the Frank Church Papers were at Stanford University. And the church family was extremely unhappy because Stanford was not treating the church papers properly. They were in a back basement not being archived. And the people in Boise and Boise State made a deal to move the church collection, his papers, to Boise State and create a room, the church room, and an archives. And when I returned to Boise State, those archives, those papers were there, and for two years I worked as an archivist in the church papers, pulling staples and putting documents in folders and hundreds of boxes of material. And we created a guide. <coughs> One of the most outstanding collections of senatorial papers in the United States. And you can go there now and it's a, a very fancy place indeed. The church room's there with desks and his chairs and uh, go see it. Boise State's very proud of it and rightfully so. So I worked in those archives and then I collected data while I was working as an archivist and then teaching full time. And then that became my doctoral dissertation. I came up with an idea with Frank Church in Latin America. My PhD was in Latin American history. And I noticed that Frank Church had studied uh, the Cuban Revolution. He was elected in 1956 when the Cuban Revolution really was going and he ended his career with the Panama Canal. And I thought, well, maybe I can do something on Latin America and Frank Church. And, but for tonight's lecture, when I started the study of Frank Church, I first came across his compassion for Senator William Bora. And that was Frank Church's childhood hero. And arguably the most famous politician in Idaho history. Now again, our history at the barn, we have teaching history, we have Minidoka, we have Native Americans, we have women, and tonight's politics in Idaho. And Idaho politics is a, like Idaho history, a complicated thing. And we tend to look at it in terms of biography and who were the greatest politicians in Idaho history and everyone would arrive at, at Bora. And, and so Bora would be one of the most significant politicians in American history. 
one of the most significant senators, not just Idaho history. And his story is an interesting one. And very briefly, I'd like to go over it. And then my first chapter of my dissertation, because my original dissertation was in the trash can, or excuse me, in the grave with my mentor who had passed away. And I was in search of a new dissertation topic because my fellowship expired. I had children. I had a job. And uh, so I wrote a chapter on Senator Bora and Frank Church. I still have it. I found it in my archives in the library with the marks of one of the great Brazilian historians in the country, my mentor, Daryl Alden, who took over my program after the mentor died, a, a Brazilian colonialist. And in red ink, I failed to see the relationship to Senator Boria to a dissertation about Frank Church. And that chapter went in the garbage can. Now, I always wanted to resurrect that chapter. And thus, we're here tonight. <laughs> Never ask someone to talk about their dissertation. No one invited me. I invited myself. <laughs> but I think the argument can be made that Senator Bora influenced Frank Church's foreign policy. Uh, and so let's briefly talk about that. Of course, Bora has a remarkable story in his own right. Uh, he was raised in the Midwest in Indiana. He went to law school in Kansas, got sick, never finished law school, but was able to complete the bar. Quite a bookworm, an intelligent guy, charismatic. The story of Boris, he got on a train then and came out west to find his way, got to Boise, he didn't have any money, and so he stayed there. Now this big thick book here, uh, Big Trouble is the story about the famous trial uh, related to the assassination of Governor Studenberg, a colleague of Senator Boras. And, and the author there, Pulitzer Prize winning Anthony Lucas, says that's an interesting story, but the fact is Bora did not drink, he did not smoke, but he loved the women. And apparently he got a young woman in Kansas pregnant, and he was on his way out of town, and he was advised to come to Boise where he started his law career, and, short, and immediately entered Idaho politics, or Republican politics. Shortly thereafter, he became involved in the trial of the century. That would be the 19th century trial of Diamond Field Jack. And we know about that so much here because it's so close. Bora was a practicing lawyer. He was hired by the state to prosecute. He came around and did research to find out about the trial. Diamond Field Jack, uh, my father's again here with us. Uh, the, the trial took place in Albion and uh, sort of a legendary event. I don't have time to deal with it here. There are books about it. Uh, I was reminded Diamond Field Jack, his name was Jack Davis, uh, got the name from his girlfriend, Diamond Field Lil, who had a gold tooth with a little diamond in the middle of it. I, I forgot that story. <laughs> Late 19th century Idaho history, the brouhaha here was between the cattle ranchers and the sheep herders. And Diamond Jack Davis was hired by the cattle barons to keep the sheep herders out. Apparently the sheep herders were also LDS in the day when there was very intense anti-Mormon sentiment in the region and a couple of those uh, sheep herders that moved in were uh, murdered. And the trial went on bringing the two most powerful lawyers in the day in Idaho history, Mr. James Hawley and Old Time uh, lawyer and governor of the state. His law firm still operates in Boise, Idaho. Frank Church ran against his grandson, John Hawley, in, in 1962. Uh, it was Hawley 
for the cattleman and, uh, and Bora, the prosecutor. Too long to go into the details there, but that certainly made uh, Bora a name. And then uh, in the first part of the 20th century, the assassination of the governor, Studenberg, you know the story. He was in a brouhaha with the miners in North Idaho. He tried to break up the mine strike. The unions organized labor had a never-ending run-in with the governor and with the industrialists. The governor went and opened up his gate in his home in Caldwell and dynamite blew him into a gazillion bits. They were looking for the pieces of the governor around town for months. <coughs> that brought Bohr then into the trial of the century against the most famous lawyer of the 20th century, Clarence Darrell. And again, the trial's a long story. I recommend this book here, Big Trouble, which is a thousand page detailed. I met Mr. Lucas here. He has another Pulitzer Prize winning book. Apparently he was criticized uh, for this book. I'm not for sure the reason. Maybe it was because of the story I told you earlier about Bora being a womanizer and, uh, and uh, frequenting the red light district in Boise on a regular occasion despite his lovely wife that he paraded around. Maybe that's what got him in trouble. Yeah. But I recommend the book. Uh, Bohr got into politics. He was elected in 1906. He served for 33 years. When he was elected, he wasn't elected because senators were not elected. They were chosen by the state legislature. That is, as you can think of Idaho politics today, whoever wins the battle within the Republican Party is going to be uh, supported by the legislature to become the senator. And that was the case in 1906, again in 1912. But, but Bora was a progressive. And I have here one of the best books on Bora. You see it there, Spearless Leader, written by one of the most outstanding Idaho historians uh, 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 out there and the author also of the Frank Church book, uh, Leroy Ashby. He, I say he's Idaho historian. He spent most of his career at Washington State University, but he's a giant in the field. And these two books, the biography of Bora and his progressivism, and then his book with Rod Grammer, uh, which I rev reviewed and published uh, a book review, um, is, uh, needless to say, quite a, a remarkable piece of work in and of itself. Bohr was a progressive. What were progressives about? In 1912, all people running for president were progressives. Returning former President Teddy Roosevelt started a third party, the Progressive Party or the Bull Moose Party, because he lost the primary to William Howard Taft and rep a Democratic candidate the most brilliant man of the age, Woodrow Wilson. They were all running as progressives. And Bora came to office in face of the old guard Republicans, and he's what's known as a progressive Republican. And one of the things that the progressives got was a series of amendments to the Constitution, one of them being direct election of senators. But in Bora's early days, he was elected through the constitutional system of state legislature. His early days, he was not involved in foreign policy, but he became famous for foreign policy. General biography says that's because of World War I. We became involved in World War I. It started, of course, in 1914, guns of August. Woodrow Wilson pledged to keep us out of war. In 1917, we were in war. Bora voted to enter the war in 1917. But he became famous for being against war. In the Spanish-American War, at the time of the Spanish-American War, he was busy with the Diamond Field Jack trial. But that's when the time when the country decided, are we going to take colonies or not? And an anti-imperialist league was formed against taking colonies, the Philippines, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the great commoner, William Jennings Bryant, 
was an anti-imperialist and, and Bora supported William Jennings Bryant. He was really an anti-imperialist and anti-war, but he voted for the war. We entered the war in April 1917. The war ended 11th day, 11th hour, 11th month, 1918. We weren't in the war for very long, but President Wilson created the peace. The 14 points, which became the Treaty of Versailles, and the 14th point, a League of Nations. Now, if you study the history of the League of Nations, or the United Nations, it's Teddy Roosevelt who first thought about the idea. He was the most famous progressive Republican of them all. But as Ashley points out, the, the Republicans were split. Most of them were opposed to foreign policy imperialism. They thought big corporations were going to run American foreign policy and Bora and Hiram Johnson and most Republican progressives were not Teddy Roosevelt international Republicans. A very interesting split. It's after the war when Bora becomes famous, when the Treaty of Versailles is signed, and we all know our constitutional history, the president negotiates the treaty, the Senate has the power of ratification. What's the Senate's power in making foreign policy? We're talking about two senators in their shaping of American foreign policy. Presidents make foreign policy. Senators have a pretty big say in it as well. And the treaty-making power is the one. Wilson made the treaty. He brought it back. Wood, Woodrow Wilson campaigned on its ratification. Senator Bora led the campaign against ratification of the Treaty of Versailles that ended the First World War. Now, just to sort of stop there for a second and, and be provocative, if we, when we're done and we assess Bora, because in the end, what happened as a result of World War I, the end of the Treaty of Versailles, there is a League of Nations, but the United States doesn't join. And then 20 years later, the Second World War, and us historians would sit around and say, well, we should have done some things after the First World War to avoid the Second World War, and that leads us to a period in diplomatic history called the interwar years, which I studied at great length uh, for many years myself. So here's Bora in the interwar years. In the United States, we're out of the treaty. Of, so what do we do? Bora championed what's called outlawry of war. We're going to make war illegal. And that led to a policy that you might know of called the Kellogg-Briand Pact. And that is if anybody goes and takes territory aggressively, like Russia in Ukraine, we're not going to recognize it. Or Japan in China when we get to the Manchurian crisis, and there's another doctrine at that point known as the Stimson Doctrine. And so Bora's position then in the interwar years is we're going to try to stay out of war, and we're going to have conferences, but we're not going to be in the League of Nations. And then when war started to brew in the 1930s, as Hitler came to power with the Depression and the fascists in Italy and the Civil War in Spain with the fascists, and the United States passed laws called neutrality laws. And those were laws that led by the famous Nye Committee, one of Bora's colleagues in the Senate. Why did the First World War start? because of the entangling economic connections. The conclusions, we have no entangling connections with governments that are belligerent in war. So when the Spanish Civil War started, the United States could not support any side. By not supporting any side, we're supporting a side. And of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and I should say that Bora became the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee 
and during the Coolidge period and the Hoover period, he supported those Republican politics, and he is the most powerful foreign policy maker of that time. But in 1932, Roosevelt is in, and he's in a minority position, but what he does is advocate this, let's be neutral. And neutral to the bitter end, and I'll end the more business here, to the bitter end, he was unhealthy, and he became an obstructionist, and people felt like he was a blowhard, and he gave these America first, long-winded, one of the most powerful speakers in the history of the American Senate. But like your beloved here, long-winded. <laughs> and many people didn't like him because he was a never-ending opponent to Republicans. And then, of course, he is famously opposed to Woodrow Wilson. Now, he supported many New Deal policies because he was afraid of big business and corporations and in favor of agrarianism. And what Idaho got from the New Deal was enormous, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. And so it put Bora in an interesting position, and the book, Spearless Leader, sort of uses this as an example, how the, the, um, um, there was this sort of conflicted progressives. And the best example they use is drinking, one of the progressive Amendments was prohibition, and Bora supported it to the bitter end. And in the late 1920s, when people said, we got to get rid of uh, 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 the prohibition amendment, churches, no, 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 it's the Constitution, it's the law, we need to enforce it. Now, at the same time, there's civil rights in black history. What did the progressives do for black folks? And there's laws, anti-lynching laws. And Bora famously, at the end of his career, predicted there would be no World War II and stood up against anti-lynching laws. So what a complicated character. Yet in his term, after all of those terms, 33 years, January 1940, he woke up dead from a, a terrible stroke. So Frank Church was a young man during the Bora period and after Bora died and he became a legend. His statutes in the, in the state, uh, the national capital, and he's a giant figure in American politics. Patriotic, America first, being against uh, international relations. That's what George Washington and Thomas Jefferson told us to do to stay out of entangling alliances. And we live that as a religion until, until the Thirty Years' War that he lived through, the, the First World War and the Second World War. And Frank Church was born and raised in the Cold War. He served in China. He was a boy orator in uh, Boise, one as a youngster uh, sort of speaking competitions, published a front page article in the Idaho Statesman about how important uh, William Bora was. And um, uh, the book, uh, Fight, uh, Fighting the Odds, when I reviewed the book, it's like Frank Church had to overcome all of these obstacles. He got very sick when he was young. When he went to Harvard, the first year at Harvard, he got sick the first year with cancer. He had to leave, came back to Stanford where he was in medical treatment. So he had sort of a tough go. In the book review, I'm like Frank Church fighting the odds. The guy was born, in, like me, in a blessed household. In an affluent household, his father ran a sporting goods store. He, why did Frank Church win as a Democrat four consecutive Senate elections. When I started the study, that's the $64 million question. Bora won in a landslide every time. Now that's not to suggest Idaho politics is Republican and not Democrat because in the early 20th century, Idaho was populist and Idaho was progressive and Bora was a progressive. 
and we had lots of democratic representation. And Frank Church came from a Catholic Republican family, and his son in his book, Fathers and Children, says, Frank Church in the 1930s left the church and the Republican Party at the same time. His son's a, a, a minister, and, he, and, and during the Vietnam days, his son and Frank Church had a, well, not as difficult a time as my father and I had, but something similar. My father and I agreed on the war. Frank Church was in political office, and his son went out protesting the war, which ca caused Frank Church a great deal of heartache, a great deal of difficulty. I guess he grew his hair long and was sort of a hippie type for a little while and, and that sort of thing. And so Frank Church was, uh, was very fortunate. He went to Harvard, then he went to Stanford. He dropped out of Stanford, went to, served in the military, hung out with big shots in the Chiang Kai-shek regime, which was the government the United States supported until the collapse of Chiang Kai-shek in the face of the communist revolution of uh, uh, Mao Zedong. And that was important for Church that time he spent there. And, he was in a position that got him to the surrender signing on the USS Missouri after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so that military experience was important. He came back, finished his law degree at Stanford, went to Boise, practiced law. Oh, oh no, I forgot the most important point. Why did Frank Church win four elections? Because his senior year at Boise High School, Chase Clark, was the governor. We talked about Chase Clark when we talked about Minidoka. Chase Clark was the, mini, uh, the governor. Chase Clark's brother had been the governor previously. They were big shot lawyers, business people in Mackey and Idaho Falls, a kind of a political economic dynasty, the Clark family. And when Chase Clark was governor, Bethine Clark came to Boise for her senior year of high school where she meant Frank Church, and the rest is history. They fell in love and Church buried into the, one of the most powerful political families in Idaho, and there's no doubt about it that Frank Church's success was largely, in large part, due to Bethine and her connections and her political skills. But Frank Church had remarkable political skills himself, his speaking ability, he was young and then uh, failed in the election for state legislature, practiced law for a bit, and in 1956, oh, I hate to say it, the year I was born, <laughs> Frank Church ran for the Senate. One of the most interesting uh, elections, the incumbent was a, a Red Scare supporter, a McCarthy supporter, uh, anti-communism, which was the story of the 1950s, uh, and he had the uh, opportunity of incumbency. Uh, but he, of course, MacArthur, uh, McCarthy was discredited, and Church thought at the age of 32, this would be a chance for him to run, but he had to win the, the primary against one of Idaho's most colorful and interesting politicians, the singing cowboy, uh, Glenn Taylor. And I learned my politics from my father here, talking about Frank Church and Glenn Taylor, who was senator from Idaho, a Democrat, a progressive, a socialist, and ran on the progressive ticket with Henry Wallace. They didn't win. Came back then to run in the primary against Frank Church. And as I learned it at my household, the election was stolen. Church became, church became the nominee because of some shenanigans in Mountain Home. It was 50 vote difference, 50 vote difference. And then what happened is Glenn Taylor announced to run as a write-in and this left a kind of a socialist progressive of the left and Welker, a kind of a radical Red Scare McCarthy. And there was Frank Church, pretty boy, articulate, kind of in the middle, and he won that election incredibly. 
And then he went to Congress and he got under the arm of one of the most powerful politicians in the history of the United States, Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson put him on the Foreign Relations Committee. What he always wanted, like his boyhood hero, uh, Bora, and in that first term, according to Dr. Tremaine, in his real book, <laughs> Frank Church learned about foreign policy. The Cuban Revolution, when Fidel Castro took over the government and overthrew the dictatorship of Fulgencio Batista. And what are we going to do with the spread of communism in the Western Hemisphere? And here it is, 90 miles off from our coast. And quickly to follow that story, well, the United States in 1933, Franklin Roosevelt, with the support and advocacy of Bora, initiated a good neighbor policy. We will no longer intervene into Latin America. We did it in Cuba like 15 times, Nicaragua, every country in South America. That's what inspired me to get a PhD in the field. What brought us to send the troops into Latin America? Why do they hate us so much? I asked my mentor, Cuban refugee, Dr. Orlando Bonachea, why do they hate us so much? Because of supporting the dictators. And so Church, because of the Castro Revolution, decided it wasn't communism. He gave a famous speech. It's not communism that we need to be worried about. It's nationalism. And Fidel Castro is a product of Cuban nationalism. And I think that probably he's correct, but at the time it was seen in terms of communism. We made a pledge not to invade, but secretly we wanted to overthrow the Castro government. And in a secret invasion known as the Bay of Pigs, the greatest diplomatic debacle in American history, we secretly invaded to try to overthrow Fidel Castro. Church went to the hearings. And in those hearings, he heard people say, well, um, you know, we didn't really know what the, wasn't very well coordinated. And Church concluded Castro was about ready to collapse. We isolated him economically. He couldn't survive without foreign oil. He got no oil. We produced oil for Cuba. The deal, we, we got sugar from them. They got oil. And when we put the sugar embargo on, Cuba turned to the Soviet Union and got their oil from then. Once we sent in the, the, the Bay of Pigs operation, that led to one of the most dramatic events in the history of Western Civ, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Frank Church was up for his first term election. And he was telling people in Idaho, don't worry about Castro. And he went to Guantanamo Bay and he toured it and he said, if Castro comes, we'll, we'll kick his ass. Something to that effect. And then the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is an interesting point because now all of a sudden Church looks like he's been leading his constituents along. And what he did was to leave the campaign. That occurred in October. The election is in November. He called off his campaign and went to Washington, D.C. And there he was with with Kennedy and sort of in the middle, and people thought, well, you know, here's Frank Church, did the right thing, it's like the campaign's off, and he's got connections, and he was able to win that election. But unlike Bora, all of Church elections uh, uh, were sort of tight. Uh, now, from there in Church's second term, it's all about the Vietnam War. In my doctoral dissertation, my argument is, we all know about Frank Church because of the Vietnam War, he became famous because of that, the so-called uh, Cooper Church, uh, Church Amendment uh, and his opposition to Lyndon Johnson, the man that made his political career. Um, and, and in 1964, when the North Vietnamese fired a missile at the USS Maddox, Lyndon Johnson went to Congress and asked for permission to do whatever necessary to deal with the, the offense. And that Gulf of Tonkin resolution then gave Lyndon Johnson, without declaration of war, the leverage to expand the war in Vietnam to the point where 
Eventually, he ordered 24-hour round-the-clock bombing of Vietnam to no avail. Frank Church voted for the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Much like Bora voted for the First World War. Lots of people were against the First World War. Bora voted against it, or for it, but then he was always against it. Church voted for Tonkin, and then, of course, later on decided that the Vietnam War was a bad idea and that we needed to negotiate. There's a very famous church story about Lyndon Johnson taking him to the corner of the room to talk to him about his vote and his shift. And Johnson was one tough son of a bitch, and he got his way by getting in people's face. And, and the story is he was right under Church's face lecturing him about, next time you want a bridge in Idaho, talk to Walter Lippmann, who was a famous journalist at the time. And uh, uh, Church, of course, took it with great dignity, and, um, and that was a big shift. 1968, the first year of my political memories. Now you know I was just 12 years old then, <laughs> and Frank Church, but, but Richard Nixon. Left for dead in California earlier, defeated in the 1960 election by Kennedy. You'll not have Nixon to kick around any longer and here he runs for president. And of course at that point, we're gonna get out of Vietnam, or we're gonna get out slowly, and the Nixon plan was we can't get out and, and lose to the communists. We can't lose. We gotta Vietnamize. It's very much like the Iraq business. They have to stand up before we can stand down. And Nixon's gonna get us out. In 1972, we're still in. I saw a quote from Bethany Church as I was reviewing, you've been working on this for seven years and we're still in this war. So Frank Church became famous for this shift and the leading voice against the war and then eventually why did the Vietnam War end? Well, because the dead bodies coming home. We discovered that the government was lying to us. The Tet Offensive were winning and then there's a massive offensive. The famous Be Lai Massacre, a Look Magazine photo opportunity where American Marines went into a village and laid waste women, children, dogs, and then were put on trial for war crimes. And the government said, we didn't, we didn't order. What were those soldiers doing? And they were doing exactly what they were ordered to do. The Congress pulled the plug on the funds. Well, and then, of course, there followed shortly this business about Watergate and the resignation of Nixon, and then churches up again in a different age. In 1974, he's able to win the election, and, and then he becomes, like Bora, a leading voice in American foreign policy and American politics. And like Bora, who on a couple occasions dabbled in running for president, Frank Church in 1976, in, in, uh, 1976 in Idaho City declared his run for the presidency. I wanted to say up front for you all, especially the students, uh, you think about Bohr, and I always tell students, you, us historians, we want to study dead people. So study Bohr, I never knew Bohr. I know him from these books and the statue. I knew Frank Church. I got to meeting, I went to Beth Ean's 90th birthday party, and I followed his whole, whole career. So sort of history as you kind of witness it, as opposed to history uh, as you study it. And certainly the last term of Frank Church's, I was a college student, and I got to meet him there at Boise State. And what made Frank Church? He knew how to take care of constituents. His first election was about the wilderness and dealing with Hell's Canyon. I just did a book review up in Orofino, of all places, on uh, uh, Lynn Jordan's wife wrote the book, maybe you've read it, uh, Below Hell's Canyon, and Frank Church worked with Senator Jordan on the Hell's Canyon trying to keep the dams out or just build one dam. Now, I know they failed, but they, they, they ultimately 
yielded Idaho Power, uh, but they put it off for 10 years. Uh, but that was the genesis of kind of wilderness, and Frank Church spent his career in wilderness. All of my research never looked at it. Never looked at Church's business on civil rights. Never. There's all kinds of Frank Church stuff that... In 1976, Church ran for president. And the story goes that he might have won, and at my PhD defense, I suggested Frank Church almost became president. One of the smartest historians in the history of the United States, Robert Burke, on my committee, Mr. Tremaine, do you think a senator from Idaho with like four electoral votes, really, really, do you really believe that? And I'm like, well, okay, never mind, forget that. <laughs> But he entered the primaries, as some of us remember, and he won primaries, and he had momentum. And then there in Oregon, primary, uh, a liberal from California entered the race and split the ticket of liberals, and ultimately the peanut farmer came out on top, and Frank Church <laughs> went back to the Senate in the end of his career in 1979 arguing for a new foreign policy, the Cold War policy of looking at things as communism everywhere. We learned the fallacy of that in Korea. We learned the fallacy of that in Vietnam. We learned the fantasy of that uh, in um, Cuba. We learned the fantasy of that in Central America. What happened then? The fear of the spread of Castroism into Venezuela the spread of Nicaragua. And of course, uh, uh, they failed to read the book, Inevitable Revolutions, Revolution in Central America. Walter Lefebvre said, that's coming. And then the end of Church's career, he took on what he considered to be the most important and sensitive topic, topic the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal was entered into the Teddy Roosevelt. He famously told Congress, I took the canal and left Congress to debate it. The Panama Canal was owned by Columbia, the uh, Panama Territory. It was um, an effort to build a canal for a decade in the 1870s by the French. The United States wanted to build a canal in Nicaragua. That would be a sea level canal. But we opted for Panama because of the politics. To build a canal in Panama, and I reckon re the, the great book, Path Between Two Seas, uh, David McCullough, we had to build the lock system. But, but Columbia owned the most valuable piece of real estate in the Western Hemisphere, the Isthmus of Panama, and they're not selling. The United States supported the revolution in Panama that created Panama. Roosevelt famously sent the Navy to prevent Columbia from sending troops to put down the rebellion. And then a few days later, signed the hey philip Buenavaria Treaty that gave the United States a 10-mile swath of land, the canal zone, and permission to build the Panama Canal. One of the greatest political engineering feats in the history of the 20th century. My mentor said this is the equivalent of putting man on the moon at the time. They couldn't build the canal because of the damn mosquitoes. And eventually they solved the mosquito problem. They built the canal with the understanding that someday the canal would be turned back to Panama. And from the time of William Howard Taft until Richard Nixon, it was negotiated. And Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger agreed to give the canal back to Panama. And then it was left for Frank Church and Jimmy Carter to finish those negotiations. And Church led the negotiations. What does the Senate do? Ratify the treaty. So they enter a treaty, the Senate ratifies it, but the Senate's not about ratifying it. And Frank Church lost the election in 1980 to a farmer from Caldwell, Senator Sims. And uh, the day before the election, a full page ad the Idaho statesman, give Frank Church back, not the Panama Canal. Now, many people think that Frank Church lost the election 
of 1980 because of his advocacy in favor of the Panama Canal, Canal Treater, Treaty that was ratified and the canal was turned back to Panama with all kinds of conditions that we can intervene for a variety of reasons which Senator Church insisted upon. Now there's theories about why he's defeated. Our dear friend Ron Hutchinsbuehler published an article that he was defeated because Jimmy Carter conceded. He went on TV and said, I give an hour before the polls closed. And he did a study that all kinds of people in North Idaho and in early Idaho history, North Idaho was democratic and they would go out and vote for church. They didn't go out and vote because it was already decided. But I think Church was always on a thin line. And why was he successful? I argued because he really wasn't a liberal. He was always in favor of gun control. A, a, a Second Amendment, no gun control. I have pictures of him carrying around his gun and fly fishing. And people believed in public lands and wilderness. And he supported that. What he did was take care of constituents at the archives. I looked through the letters. These people wrote letters and he wrote letters back. And, and Bethine, they got in their car and went to every town and, and met in courthouses and face-to-face old-fashioned politics. And, and he made Idahoans proud. Bora and Church were like independent. They're not following the party line. And, and the Church parted with Johnson. And uh, so it's very interesting. I was saying as I was preparing this, uh, telling Professor Matthews, since Church was defeated, the last Democrat to serve in the national office. Now, that's not true. Uh, but in Catherine Aiken's article about idol politics, she divides it into these four parts. The, the early days, that would be the territorial period up to 1920. That's Bora. And Bora's a product of the territorial period that practiced in the early 20th century. Then she talks about this period where we become, become modern between the wars. And then post-World War II, what I've talked about with Frank Church in 1980. In the 1980, the liberal slaughter, Idaho politics, the move to the right. And so since Church, our Idaho politics have move to the right. There's no question about that. Um, and, and, and with that, thank you very much for your time and attention. I want some questions and comments. I've asked Samra to join me here and have the moderator's prerogative and ask questions if she likes, or she, uh, uh, or she can just take your questions. If you have questions, don't throw things. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I didn't go over time too much, I hope, and I appreciate you not throwing things. questions for you and since it is my prerogative I'll ask I'll ask a question and then I'll invite you all to join us too my first question is going to be about obviously Senator Church and you talked about his comments about Cuba and nationalism his stance on Vietnam how do you think Senator Church foreign policy positions set him apart from other politicians of the time how do you, what, what do you think set him apart well, so uh, my notion is he came from what I came from, um, the, what we call the Cold War consensus. After World War II, uh, you have the, the end of Bora's world, which is what we call balance of powers. There's a bunch of different states. And if one state gets too strong, others join up. With the end of World War I, World War II, that goes up in smoke at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Germany's toast, France, England, the British Empire, Winston Churchill, all. I'll be damned if I'm going to demise, uh, uh, preside over the demise of the British Empire. But that's what he did. And so what's left are two new superpowers, two powers, the Soviet Union and, and the United States. And so Church grew up in this Cold War consensus. And for him to break and be critical of the Vietnam War, people critical of the Vietnam War in the early days were considered unpatriotic, and he voted for Tom Gulf of Tonkin because there were soldiers in the field. So you can't pull the support for the troops while we got soldiers in the field. 
Um, so when he came out against the Vietnam War, that took incredible courage, and that was very much against the status quo. And I would, I would say uh, also, uh, Samra, uh, the wilderness business. You know, wilderness in Idaho, the cattle people, the timber people, the miner people, us tree huggers are not popular people. Now, Frank Church, Bethine's family owned a home, Robinson Bar Ranch, on the Salmon River, a spectacular place. I've never been there. Uh, uh, Lynn Jordan's family was just a canyon over there in Hell's Canyon. And when he got into the wilderness stuff, they had to sell the home. It looked like a conflict. How can we have this spectacular home of private residents on the Salmon River, like a dude ranch, and be arguing for wilderness? And so they, they sold it. So uh, wilderness was unpopular. Civil rights was unpopular. And... Um, and the Panama Canal Treaty was extraordinarily unpopular. And so, you know, the guy had political, uh, political courage. Now, uh, you know, he was a lawyer mm -hmm. and he was a brilliant politician. And so I had the, the ability to, the, the privilege of hearing Frank Church speak, not Bora, I'm not that old. And I'll never forget it was as there with my mentor, uh, Bob Sims. And Bob Sims, was a, a, unlike the crazy, radical, disorganized crap I just did, Bob Sims, is this really brilliant, organized presenter, one of the best public speakers I've ever seen. And when I was sitting with Bob Sims listening to Frank Church speak, I mean, he looked at me with, with tears in his eyes. He says, that's how you do it, Russ. That's how you do public speaking. <laughs> and of course, I can't do that. But, but yeah, I think he was pretty, pretty um, courageous. Um, can I'll ask one more, and then I'll. Um, and you mentioned it. You know his support for the Wilderness Act and the Scenic Rivers Act. Which do you think is more important to his legacy, foreign policy or protected wilderness? Well, now I'd be biased here. Uh, that was his passion. He was always on the Foreign Re Relations Committee. He wanted to be uh, chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, and he achieved that in like 1979. Then he's out. Uh, but he always played that role, and, and again, he was involved in the Cuban Revolution, one of the most important events uh, of uh, U.S.-Latin American relations. That's a, a d dividing line. Lyndon Johnson sent in troops into the Dominican Republic and, and, and to try to stop the spread, uh, and that was a very controversial period. And there's nothing uh, more controversial and problematic in American history than the, uh, than the Vietnam War. And he played a central role in, you know, the argument in the Vietnam War, where were the liberals? Or excuse me, that's my argument. Because a, a, a generation later, as we were going into war, in places I thought we shouldn't be going into war, and I was making a stink. And I would say, look, in the Vietnam War, everybody supported the war, and then a decade later, where were the liberals? Where were the people against the war when we were all in? And so, like, I'm against the war right now, right up front, because I don't want to be uh, come to the party uh, 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 later kind of guy. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that his legacy is foreign policy. That was his love. Now, as an Idahoan, mm -hmm. and a lot of the criticism, I was reading about his first election there, he, he faced a recall. Uh, and again, always contentious, but we didn't send to go, a guy to go off and join the new frontier, the, the John Kennedy plan, and to go become some kind of expert on foreign policy. So he's criticized because he's concerned about foreign policy. Now, Bohr was so protected and insulated, uh, it didn't matter. Bohr, depending on how you, who you talk to, he didn't pay that much attention to his constituents. He didn't have to. Church was always tended to things at home and bringing the bacon home, if you will. And um, so those wilderness water issues, you know, they were close to home. And, and, and I think it was, I don't think it was like he was doing it for political reasons. I think that was, uh, he, he, he liked to fish, he liked to hunt. Uh, he was an outdoorman. He, uh, like lots of us, loved that wilderness. And, and he believed in public lands. And, you know, that's a big debate private land, public land. Idaho wants to take over the land, sell it off to private people. Some people, uh, we want public land. That's all of our land. That's a huge debate. And so that was a popular one. I know from where you, the two of us sat, uh, 
It's like uh, that might not seem popular back then in the 1960s and 70s, the environmental movement, the environmental decade, and church was, you'd say, on the right side of history then. I'm not sure how that would fly maybe, maybe now. <laughs> Yeah, whenever I think of Frank Church, the first thing I think of, honestly, is wilderness. It's, it's it, you know, it's Idaho, and it's where it's the first natural thing. Um, so what about from the audience? Does huh. anybody have any questions, comments? I don't want to hog the whole thing, but what does, um, what do you all say? Any questions? Hey, Pops, tell me that Glenn T story, that Glenn <laughs> Taylor story. Yeah. Arnell, get this old guy on camera. Glenn Taylor stealing an election from Frank Church in 1956. What was Frank Church's uh, uh, timeline as far as entering politics? 1956 to 1980. He's elected 1956 to 1980. And then, then that cancer came back. Uh, he was 59 years old. Uh, four years after he was voted out of office, he died. I mean, I learned more about Frank Church just listening to you right now. But I remember his name was popping up, and I was only 14 years old, but during Watergate. But I know I mean, he was just part of the cabinet, right? Well, so during, he'd certainly be in, in the middle of the Watergate, but remember those Watergate hearings were in the, in the House, and he's in the Senate. And before, in, in the impeachment proceedings, you have that hearing in the House, and then if they have probable cause, it goes to the Senate for a trial. And, and President Nixon resigned before it ever got to the trial stage. So Church get, didn't get in the middle of that brouhaha. But he did get in the middle of uh, Richard Nixon in terms of the Vietnam War and Henry Kissinger. And he was a constant um, uh, combatant with uh, Nixon and his, um, his policy on the, foreign, uh, on the foreign policy. Ultimately, what Nixon decided to do was to expand beyond uh, what Johnson and to bring in nuclear weapons and take North Vietnam out and uh, um, and uh, you know we're trying to get out of the war and and Nixon uh, expanded it he's we're going to get out of the war in 68 and then in 72 we're still going to get out of the war and um, and eventually we got out um, well I think because of the the budget the, the Congress cut the budget <laughs> but pops uh, Every, anybody here ever heard of Glenn Taylor? Glenn Taylor, one of, the, one of Idaho's most famous politicians. Pop, tell that story. Huh? Well, yeah. uh, Glenn Taylor was uh, uh, quite, a, quite a guy. And uh, he used to play guitar and, and, and sing for the group. And... Uh, Everybody loved Glenn Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I, as I learned the story at the dinner table in Mountain Home, you know, we have these history of elections, and so in Mountain Home in this precinct, it votes this way, and these people study it, and so curiously, there was one precinct that tended to go this way and went that way, and it was just like a, a very close count. I think it came down in the end to a, a, a 170 uh, votes, and so it's a... Uh, uh, very colorful politicians. Idaho, we have very colorful politicians, and uh, certainly Glenn Taylor was one of them. But Qu questions, yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, tell me if I'm wrong. One of the things that church is really good at is going door to door, and knocking, and talking to people one on one. He won his first election that way. Yeah. Okay. Well, absolutely. And then in politics, remember. A political scientist, the power of incumbency, you know, it, once you have office. And so even though the chur church could win, uh, and again, I think because he's not, we all decided he's this liberal, he wasn't as liberal as we think, well, once, once you think about it. So right, the way that he took care of constituents, they went to courthouses, they were constantly campaigning, and he had this great skill. I'll, I'll tell you my personal story. So I never met Frank Church, and but I was teaching at Boise State, uh, there uh, when I was a very young man, 20, 20 some years old, and church was there in uh, the late 1970s, uh, 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 right at the end of his political career giving a speech, and he was standing on the Capitol. Now, in my late years at the, as a student, I worked at the Fourth District Court because I was going to law school. So I knew the prosecuting attorney there, a guy named uh, Harris, and there was Frank Church up on the step after his speech with the prosecuting attorney, and they were chatting, 
and I'm sort of walking up with my high school buddy who had dropped out of high school to go to the military, but now four years later was back, and I was a grad student, a big shot, running around campus, and, and we walked up there to, to introduce ourselves to Frank Church, and Frank grabbed my hand and shook my hand, Russ, how you doing, like we were old friends. <laughs> and I'd never met the guy, of course my buddy, uh, Tommy Wright, he's like, oh my God, Tremaine is a big dude here. So he had, now later I'm like, now how, that was a trick. And so I know that, that, that uh, Mr. Harris had sort of whispered in the air, there's this asshole, Russ Tremaine. Give <laughs> So yeah, no, he had, a, he had a tremendous personality. And you know what we'd call those uh, political skills. But then he could massage these issues, uh, Jewish. Uh, there's a time there where people come out against Israel. You cannot get elected in American politics unless you have the support of the Jewish lobby, uh, so the saying goes. Now, people come out critical of our carte blanche support of Israel. Church supported Israel absolutely. He supported Second Amendment rights absolutely. So those would go into the camp of sort of conservative, and uh, you know, we call him liberal, and he wasn't afraid of being called a liberal. Now, when people call me a liberal, I get cranky, and like, don't call me a liberal, I'm a historian. And there's different kinds of liberals. But what Church did was to make a famous speech in defense of liberalism. And what is that? Well, we, the church does its thing, the state does its thing. Sort of a classical liberalism, the, the state does things that it has to do that free enterprise won't do. And then, then Remember, Bohr was the champion against the League of Nations. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, FDR at the end of World War II, create the, the International League of Nations, the United Nations. And so that's sort of an interesting idea. And, and Church was a staunch defender of the United Nations, which is not a popular position. And he gave a famous speech on the 20th anniversary of the United Nations, 1965, in defense of the United Nations. Unlike Bora, who thought we had to stay out of things, Church thought that we had to deal with international relations in the context of the uh, United Nations and international organizations. And, uh, but Nixon, when he was accused, uh, came out against Vietnam, he was accused of being a neo-isolationist. So to withdraw from Vietnam and give the war to the, the communists, that was unthinkable. Um, so yeah, to think that in the end he's a, a neo-isolationist, which of course he was not. Now, just another uh, point. Church became famous uh, for other things. One, the investigation, what are called the church investigations. One of the CIA, CIA and FBI into their operations, spying on people in the country and spying on and trying to overthrow governments abroad. Most famously, trying to execute Fidel Castro. Uh, helping execute the democratically elected leader of Chile. And Church asked the question, should we be in the business of overthrowing governments with the secret intelligence organization that's operating what he called a rogue elephant. We don't know what the CIA is doing in Chile, in Africa. And, and what the church investigation did was to unveil that. And then the other church investigation was to look at corporations operating and how corporations were meddling in foreign governments, most significantly in Chile, IT&T and the copper companies were responsible for overthrowing the socialist government of Allende, leading to the most ruthless dictatorship in the history of the Western Hemisphere, Augusto Pinochet. And Church thought that our government shouldn't be in the business of doing that. And that's interesting because Bohr was progressive companies leading American foreign policy down a, a bad path, 
and church was very much concerned about economic interests and a sort of a secret a government, CIA. Now, after 9-11, Frank Church and this committee came back. And I was contacted, and I was irate. 9-11 happened because the church investigations destroyed American intelligence system. Church caused Americans to die. And 9-11, and I'm like, you guys, wait just a second. Now, we had the Reagan administration, the Clinton administration. You know, I don't see how you can hold Frank Church responsible for the failure of our secret service. And then just this week, Today, the Congress is organizing committees to investigate the uh, intelligence agency. They think that it's been weaponized, that it's being used politically, and people are referring to the church investigations, and that's sort of what is being resurrected here. Obviously, circumstances uh, are different. Other questions or comments? I know our time runs short. Um, I have one more. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Hi, I want to, <laughs> when church was getting all of the wilderness and the public land stuff going, like the miners, ranchers, bloggers, and all that, what, how was there, like, how did he still do it, you know, do all this? <coughs> well, great, great question. A great question and a, a subject for a subject for another day. So there have been books written about Frank Church in the wilderness, and I mentioned at the time in his first term, the big issue was over Hell's Canyon and building dams. Uh, and then they kind of made a moratorium where that was put off. Now the Frank Church wilderness was something that was de debated, and uh, we just had a symposium, a conference on the, uh, the anniversary of the Wilderness Act, and our congressman here Congressman Simpson has been in the middle of a long brouhaha trying to update, update and revise the sort of wilderness that was created um, back at the time. But that's very complicated stuff because what Frank Church did then, and then the church, the wilderness being named after Frank Church, there's a big disconnect between the activities to create the wilderness and then ultimately it being designate, designated and the activity of creating that wilderness is a very long, complicated story. I recommend the book that the Idaho Humanities Council published on the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act. And it's a collection of essays. Uh, we had a conference here uh, about it here on CSI campus, not at the barn. And so it's a huge subject, it's a big topic. Church was in the middle of it. And I'd be happy to chat with you over a cup of coffee or a cold beer and chew your ear off about it. The rest of these people are ready for bed. Okay, well, I... I <laughs> or, excuse me, I'm ready for bed. Yes, I want to respect all of your time, and I want to thank <laughs> Russ Tremaine for doing a fantastic job, like always. <laughs> um, I also want to thank the Idaho Humanities Council, Preservation Twin Falls, and CSI for helping put this together. I know we have some CSI students in the back here too, so I'm always excited when they're able to attend. So thank you all for being here on a school night. Um, and with that, um, drive safe. Yeah. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you.